Hey, Ilu, thanks so much for taking the time today. I know the Jazz Memes family is excited to uh, hear what you have to say and to learn more about you. Uh, I know we are. We, I mean, we've been uh, deep diving into everything that you do and, and found even more stuff I didn't even know about. So we're excited. So thanks for coming on. Hey, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, for those who you don't know out there in the Jazz Memes family, Ilu is a pianist a DJ, a speaker, a pian a director, a screenwriter. And it, for us, he's even more than that. I, I kind of view you as a mentor to jazz memes. So uh, I, I really take this uh, on a whole other level as far as any time we have an interaction. So uh, thank you again. Um, today, I wanted to start with something that we've never gotten to talk about. You might have talked about a little bit in some other interviews or on other, uh, you know, uh, media outlets like uh, Jazz Night in America, where right. you talk about going back to when you won the Monk competition. And sure. I think this is important to talk about just because it sets the stage for everything that's come since. Um, you win the Monk competition, you demonstrate the highest level of excellence on the instrument in jazz. Um, you know, you're, you're playing with the top artists in the, in the field. Mm -hmm. And you're young, you know, you're younger than even I am. And you, you meet this resistance or you meet this, you get to this point where you're not, you're, you're not seeing the next step kind of unfold that's expected or kind of, you know, told is the next step in, in jazz. And, and then a lot of artists are told is what will happen. So what, what happened at that moment and what was this resistance or this moment of struggle that you reached? You know, you're at the highest of highs, so to speak, that we're, you know, you're told on your instrument in jazz and you meet this resistance. Well, first off, much love to you guys. Thanks for having me and looking forward to sharing this time with you. So to get to that question, looking back, as it is with most things, there are passions, there's things that one can feel at the moment, and there can be very valid reasons for feeling those things. However, the element of not being omniscient comes into play too. Mm -hmm. So at this point in time now, I'm a business owner, entrepreneur, I've carved my own way, I've learned so much that I did not know when I was 26 years old, having just won the Monk competition. And also, even though I was a Dean's List full scholarship student at Manhattan School of Music, I don't know what the curriculum is now, but at the time that I was there, there was nothing really in the curriculum that would prepare me for some of the real politic as they say that phrase, Russian phrase, real politic mm -hmm. that goes on in the business. So I had a lot of my hopes and dreams, aspirations pinned upon my assessment of the industry. However, that assessment was rather incomplete. And then also, we have the element of bias, my own personal bias. So see, what I want to establish here first is a lot of what I was accountable for that I was unaware or even resistant to accepting that I was accountable for, that I'm far more aware of or in acceptance of being accountable for. It's all very ironic and twisted. And this is how these things go. A lot of times when we have these kinds of scenarios, it starts to boil down to a matter of force. And that's one thing that the ELU brand is notable for, mm -hmm. force. Mm -hmm. Because that was one thing that I could understand at that time, being a chess player and being just a energetic and survivor of panic attacks and depression, I understood that it took force and sometimes counterintuitive force 
to get through things, to survive, to rock. You know, that's how that all came into being. So the irony and the paradox of it all is that the, all the flaws and misapprehensions that I had with regards to the industry worked together to essentially provide the shaping forces of ELU, similar to how environmental pressures shape evolution in different species. So I had this drive to be like my heroes like Coltrane and Miles and Arch Tatum. So I had that naked, raw drive and that would push me along. And all of the stuff that I didn't know led to all the bumps and scars and everything that ended up shaping Elu. And my version of survival led me to the direction of rock and the armor and these things that are about fortitude and toughness and strength and endurance and fighting and victory and discovery and rising against intimidation and also powering through inner turmoil all of the panic attacks and the depressions that I was facing and all of that sort of thing. And also through all the hypocrisy, starting with my own and then out to other people's as well. So there were so many things that were at play. So I say all this because if I say to you what I initially felt back in those times, it could easily come off very one-sided because at the time, all that I understood was the simple raw facts, which are raw facts. I did win the Thelonious Monk International Piano Competition. I did not receive a major record deal. Mm -hmm. Things like that don't happen usually. And I think, they made it part of the actual, I guess, curriculum now that you are guaranteed a record deal when you win some of these competitions. But at my time, that wasn't a guarantee. So for me, the sort of exemption, I felt as though everyone exempted themselves from the way things were supposed to be, fair and square. And so then, essentially, I took that effrontery or that offense, and I said, oh, okay, well, in that case, I will exempt myself from all of your feelings about me rocking the F out. Mm -hmm. I guess I'll go ahead and play Nirvana myself. I mean, it's okay for the Bad Plus and Meldow, right? It's okay for Warner Jazz or these other major labels. So then, huh, then I guess I'll go ahead and do it myself. I mean, that's America. And I had to bite down and make a decision. Am I going to continue to work with Wynton Marcellus and the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra? Or do I want to actually chase my dreams for my 30s? Mm -hmm. I spent my 20s apprenticing under these great masters, Elvin Jones, Wenton Cassandra, John Hendricks, Roy Hargrove. There was no big label that came to me, but what did come to me was a little Jewish lady who believed in me. And she was like, I don't understand it, but I have a little PR company and I'm willing to help you. And I'll 
from there, I said, that's all I need. That's enough. Just a little something. Boom. And that's all I needed. And from there, pretty soon, we found ourselves on the same jazz festivals as everybody else. So Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer was doing just fine. <laughs> and that's just how things go. I had to learn so much, though. You know, there was a lot of things that were behind why people weren't interested in me representing their label. Valid reasons. And I've had to be very mature to realize the importance of that. And especially since I've had to develop my business over time and I've had to take a look at the criteria upon which I will collaborate with others and things of that nature. And so a lot of the jealousies or contempt or disapproval or sadness or any of those sorts of things that I've experienced, I've come to understand why. And a lot of it has to do with either ignorance on my part, or it's had to do with naivety, or it's had to do with, shall we say, I, I don't like the word underestimate, but perhaps overestimating how I fit into the picture mm -hmm. versus how another artist might fit into the picture. You know, another thing that happens is that oftentimes musicians, or forget musicians, artists in general, I mean, and it could zoom out from there, <laughs> But let's just keep it with artists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can we apply for that? our purposes? Humans. But quite simply, there's many situations where an artist might study, 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 study in obscurity and work super hard in, in these four walls and imprison themselves on this journey towards excellence. And here comes that word neglect other elements. Now, to their mind, well, you say neglect, I mean, I just don't really care about that stuff. I mean, whatever. However, this is the recipe for pain, especially if you have a conflicting aspiration up in there. Sure, if you want to perform your art just for your friends and family, okay, fine, you can exempt. And that word comes from Elvin Jones. Obviously, Elvin Jones didn't in invent the word exempt. But some of these masters have these special words and ways that they would use words. And that was one word that stuck out to me that he mentioned to me during a conversation once exempt. So basically, you're responsible for what you decide to exempt yourself from. There's also an ancient Greek philosophy of you may not be responsible for something, but you're accountable for something. We see a lot of this going on in the political discourse right now. And Mathematically, it doesn't really work out. However, there's another math that's of irrational numbers that does work out. And we see these kinds of things play out all the time, which is why it always comes down to a matter of force. But I don't want to digress too hard. I'm just trying to illustrate the fact and say in so many ways that let's just say you want to be someone a perfect example of a per well, you know, I, I'm hesitant to get into artist names, although I guess I already did that. But let's just take, for instance, two very visible artists that are wonderful. Like, look at Jacob Collier and look at John Baptiste. Now, these guys are fantastic 
specimens of what one needs to make sense of in the field. Now, not everyone has any kind of struggles, say, with appearance or with getting along with people or that kind of a thing, but I did. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes it will be a matter of like, well, trying to control the dialogue about what people should assess versus what they shouldn't and all of that. It took a long time for me to realize that's not in my control. And then more importantly, I had to look at from the reverse perspective, if you're a business owner, look at these guys. They're great looking right out the gate. Oren Evans made a good point. They see you before they hear you. It's an old saying. But look at these guys. I mean, they're both perfectly thin. They're super creative. They're super approachable. They're super accessible. They're super gregarious and affable. They're really nice, really nice guys. I mean, Baptiste even has a band called Stay Human. So that's really where they're coming from. Now, that type of branding was truly not where I was coming from when I was figuring out Elu because I was coming from a place of rage. I was coming from a place of betrayal. I was coming from all these darker places, much less I've never been that skinny in my life. You know what I'm saying? So there's that, although I did manage to lose some weight when I decided to really get into like the, the more pop music space. But point is that you're not going to go, as far as I know, you're not going to go to a, a music school program that's going to say, okay, first of all, here's your diet that you have to keep in order to maintain your scholarship. And here's your clothes sizes that you need to maintain in order to keep your scholarship they would really have a lot of problems with that. And especially today with the political correctness about fat shaming and things of that nature and the sort of ongoing battle we have about what is standard. I mean, even in jazz, which was part of the reason that I also created ELU, the idea of jazz does not have to swing was a concept that received plenty of force at the industrial level. So it became a thing of, wow, well, if it doesn't have to swing, then anything goes and anything has gone. Mm -hmm. And so we see the results. That's why it can be difficult to make money in a situation where there's no standard, everything goes. Part of rarity and scarcity affects economy. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, point is that the thing that I've come to appreciate about those two artists, Collier and Baptiste, Hiromi, these are jazz playing individuals that have been super creative and diversified their brand and, you know, have managed to get into mainstream culture in mighty ways. But they have one thing in common. They look amazing. They look great. They are perfectly integratable into other aspects of the business, whether it's Hollywood on screen, whether it's clothing endorsements, whether it's just as a personality, you know, and these are the things that labels are and have always been looking for. Mm -hmm. I did not have a class on that at Manhattan School of Music. There was no one in my sphere that was very compellingly bringing that to my heart. So a lot of my bewilderment and astonishment and anger was based upon a type of lack of information, essentially. Now, to be fair, there was some credibility to some of my anger some of my outrage and that speaks to the success of elu because there's truth 
in Elu in the rock jazz. It was all very specifically designed, tactically designed. So looking back, I have to say, well, I hesitate to say that I'm thankful for the bad things, but I have to say that I'll always be thankful to the Thelonious Monk Institute, now known as the Herbie Hancock Institute, but I'll always be thankful to them for giving me that win not letting politics change that win. Because that was, you know, very important for me foundationally when I decided to break away from Lincoln Center and just go ahead swimming on the, go ahead on out and swim on in the big ocean. So that's what I have to say about the Monk Institute, <laughs> that experience. Well, let, that, that, that's a great place to start to point out because you talk about these skill sets that that young that aren't taught in any sort of specific way you acquired but but let's not let's be clear for sure it still came down to you being a self starter you making those choices having the drive to when something's not going that way to push ahead and still dis, you know and discover all those things and you mentioned chess as well where you one of the things i saw across the board is that you always seem to approach situations that might appear one way in the, you know, when they're this close, you take a sort of vantage point similar to the player on the chessboard where you're looking from above. So looking from above, what were those strategies or some of the things that you've developed to create this Elu brand? Because for sure throughout from that experience, you've picked specific things and do specific things both in your uh, your appearance, your performing style, your tune choice. I mean, every aspect of your business and, and yourself as an artist, there's things that you directly now do from like that were from those lessons that you're saying that you, you started to learn. So what are those things that make the Elu branded as it is now? Well, I mean, I could discuss the components of it, I read a lot of different books, The Art of War by Sun Tzu. I read a book called The 22 Immutable Laws of Branding, which is pretty much my Bible, as far as that E. Lewis sprang from the pages of that book. The other books are more of some seasonal elements, but this is the meat and potatoes, is The 22 Immutable Laws of Branding. And I read, Musashi's Book of the Five Rings and other samurai. I read a lot of autobiographies of Navy SEALs and other special forces dudes. So there was a lot of components that came in there and each thing led to another opening of my eyes to the nature of creativity because I had to do it all myself. All I had was this little lady who said, just tell me which way to point the cannons, but you have to figure out the targets. So I did so much work to figure out targets, but I went to sleep at night really good because now I was working for myself and every little sand pebble that I would find took a pebble away from my panic attacks and depression. And eventually those pebbles built Castle Elu, you know, took me around the world under my own name, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, the armor, all these things all had to do with things coming from the book of branding. 
moving forward, even to the DJing, even to the film directing and all of that sort of kind of a thing, they all came from the book of branding and just building upon those concepts. There's also a sense of chess. I talk about this in that NPR video, the concept of Zugzwang, Zug, which is that German word that describes a situation in chess where you have no good moves, but it is your turn to move. So it's a very subtle tactic that can be imposed upon you by an opponent and you have to watch for it. A lot of times people are looking for, oh, what's a checkmate, you know, can I win this piece? But other times it's more of a monopoly kind of situation where, no, I'm just trying to control all of the good squares and the good diagonals. I wanna control this particular aspect of the center or the flank because now you're running out of good places to put your knight that wants to hop around. Now your bishop is starting to get shut in. Now your king's starting to feel a little claustrophobic. Pretty soon, you're gonna to have to sacrifice a piece just to break through some of these pawns to get out of there. So similarly, I had to create Elu to break through before I got suffocated. You know, I had to create Elu, so I did a jazz sacrifice. I did the calculation. I like the sound of that. <laughs> jazz yeah. yeah, it's like I had to sacrifice a queen in order to get the checkmate. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't an immediate checkmate. It's a real sacrifice. Mm -hmm. I had, you know, the other book that I was referring to was The Laws of Power, 48 Laws of Power. Mm -hmm. You know, you are in control of which enemies you choose to make. So you don't wanna make the wrong enemies, but if you think you can go through a competitive situation and not make enemies, then you're naive, you shouldn't be in the war. But what you wanna do is tactically make enemies. For instance, I needed to find a way to introduce myself to the pop world in a way that had some notability, but in a way that also didn't frighten them in the way that I didn't want to frighten them. In other words, because of Wynton Marsalis's brand, which is very anti-pop music, very anti-hip hop, you know, anti-rock, you know, it's, it's very, it has a, a anti-quality to it in the branding. That's how it comes off. And so it can alienate people and it can alienate people who even seem associated with it. So I did not want to deal with that guilt by association element. So I had to do something to break that association very blatantly to make it really clear. I'm not with that gang anymore. So that's when I figured out, okay, I'm going to have to, make myself an enemy of jazz, at least on the surface, so as to ingratiate myself into this other scene, which are rockers that'll be into, wow, this guy is like a rebel from this other scene and he's not gonna condescend upon us because we don't know music, you know what I'm saying, or whatever. <laughs> and so that was a tactical move. That's where the armor and looking the part and all that stuff started to come in. So again, these are all very infiltration tactics like chess or like war. At the same time, they had a, a therapeutic quality for me because I needed the rock. I needed somewhere to pour out my aggression. Jazz wasn't really designed to do that. The closest I could get to that was playing something modal in like the Coltrane civil rights type mode, but there was another fire that I was feeling that didn't have to do with religion and it didn't have to do with race politics. It had to do with psychological despair. It had to do with things and questions and perplexities that get spoken about 
in rock lyrics as opposed to Gershwin lyrics. And so that's why I was gravitating towards Linkin Park and these sorts of bands that dealt with angst and made art out of their angst. And I saw parallels and correlations between it and what Elvin Jones and Train and those guys were doing in their genre. You know, I was able to get beyond the bias of, oh, well, the drummer for Linkin Park is no Elvin Jones. No, that's not the point. Oh, Chester Bennington's voice isn't Johnny Hartman or John Coltrane. No, that's not the point. It's about the aspiration. Al Pacino taught me that word. Hmm. Obviously, Al Pacino didn't create the word aspire, but when I was sitting and talking with him one time about Shakespeare, I just seen him do Shakespeare, uh, The Merchant of Venice. He mentioned that, he mentioned the word aspiration in a particular type of context. The way he used it impressed me. I was like, oh, wow. Right, so a lot of people are aspiring. I was aspiring towards certain kind of things. There's a difference between aspiration and execution. This is why you don't have to really talk badly about people that are making mistakes or something like that. You know, they're aspiring to do something on the instrument. They may be technically failing to do it, but they're aspiring. But that's how you would say that. You don't have to cut them to pieces or dismiss them necessarily. So similarly, I saw what the rockers were aspiring towards. And I saw what they were executing as well. They weren't just aspiring, but they were aspiring. They were playing the same light, the same fire, but just from a different lens. And once I was able to get that jazz bias away from me, suddenly I had a big career. And as far as the enemy stuff, that was all part of the tactic too. Sure, we can be enemies while I establish myself. And then what do I need to do to be friends again? Oh, I've been practicing. Sure, here's Andrew the Republic. Oh, and here's now, here's Cubism. And so now all of the critics that had something to say are in reversal because I'm playing the hardest, most respected music out there in the jazz thing, you know? No one is going to fake their way through Kurt Rosenwinkel's music, and no one's going to fake their way through it solo piano. You know, it begs the question, Kurt's been playing great and composing great all this time, how come no one's recorded it solo if you're so good? So that's the type of stuff that I look for, opportunities to make my points. And so that's kind of my personality and that's kind of the componentry of ELU as it is today. I still have the rock brand and that territory is mine, that brand is mine. But now I can play around and get back to some of the things that I wanted to do in jazz in the first place, which is make some classic jazz albums that contribute and pick up where Art Tatum left off. That's my aspiration now. And my execution remains to be seen, but that's my aspiration. And I'm going to be successful in it, whatever it takes. Elo, I'm glad you brought up the Cubism album because we, we definitely want to talk about that. Um, what was the specific reason for doing the music of Kurt Rosenwinkel at that time? Is it because, uh, like you were saying, it's so challenging and you were just, you know, you're showcasing your skill in jazz against his music in a solo piano? What was the reason for that? There is a, a couple of different reasons. One's the most controversial reason I hesitate to mention, but I'll think about it. We'll see. But the... We like a good controversy. <laughs> you know, yeah, we're no stranger to controversy. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the reasons is because, first of all, I've been a fan of Kurtz ever since 
And I've been a fan of Cubism, by the way, mm -hmm. ever since I heard Mark Turner's debut album, Yam Yam. And that's way back when it was Mark Turner, Brad Meldow, Jorge Rossi, Larry Grenadier, and Kurt Rosewinkle. Fantastic, beautiful, classic little album there. Mm -hmm. And then I be began to follow Kurt because of that whole crew. And I mentioned this in the liner notes to the album. Um, the liner notes are by Nate Chinon, by the way. But I mentioned that there was something in Kurt's writing, the personality of Kurt, that was more than just a player. He was a composer, and that really came through to me. There was something very compelling about what he's doing. The other musicians have gone on to distinguish themselves and do fine things as great performers, but it was something in Kurt's writing <laughs> that got me, you know? Everybody gets got by something, but in this case of that crew, of that sound, of that particular aesthetic, it was Kurt. So there was that first element. Another element is I put out And to the Republic with Tane and Reginald Veal, and we made a hell of an album for Sunnyside. But, and we definitely got some accolades. It was cool and all that. However, I felt that the critical establishment somehow their value system or standards of something, standards of excellence were, I don't know. I had a question mark about how they viewed the album. Like I had a question mark about what they were hearing. I'm thinking to myself, are you guys hearing this? Like, that's tame. That's veal. I mean, we're, that's, this is killing. This is classic yeah. stuff. We are totally right there doing this. But it wasn't really, you know, it, something about it caught my attention. So I said, hmm. And then I heard about how Kurt apparently got into some sort of a tiff with VJ Iyer regarding VJ getting the MacArthur Prize. This is the more controversial thing. Mm -hmm. I'm going ahead and saying it. <laughs> so, <laughs> and We're so. We're a small audience, anyways. No one's going to. Yeah, hear no this. one's listening to this. <laughs> yeah, no one's. <laughs> right. <laughs> Newsflash. <laughs> <laughs> Armin calling you tomorrow. What have you done? <laughs> ah, no, no. Fortunately, we're not that powerful in this business. <laughs> so I noticed that there was a little bit of a squabble there, a little bit of a beef with regards to, you know, Kurt essentially questioning, to, to put it nicely, the award going to VJ, which I guess by assertion begs the question of, I assume he figures he should get one. Mm -hmm. But I think that I wrote a rant on Facebook, not against VJ, but more from the perspective of, I find Kurt to be compelling and my opinion actually counts because I have put in the time and I have been with the masters of this music and can play this music legitimately beyond politics. Mm -hmm. So in my opinion, Kurt does deserve a MacArthur prize. I don't need to question if someone else or invalidate 
anyone else's worthiness. That's sort of stupid, and it's not my lane. Everybody's got their own twist and their own hustle and their own thing. So cool. I don't need to knock another person's hustle, but if they're giving them out and it's supposed to be a genius award, Kurt's a genius to me. He should get one. I know pretty good and well, he probably won't. <laughs> but that said, I saw in, in that rant, I ended my rant by saying, sometimes I've mused about doing a solo piano album of Kurt's music. Hmm. And a couple of things happened. I ran into his girlfriend in LA, just at a jam session. She talked to him and some of his, some of his supporters and fans spoke with him. Kurt and I have known each other, but it's never been like bosom buddies type of, type of, type of thing. But uh, it got back to him. And it turned out that he had just launched his new record label, Hardcore. And so he said, do you want to do it? Do you want to actually do it? So I said, yeah, sure. <laughs> and so in that way, I was able to make my musical case on the piano as to why I think he is a genius. So despite the, shall we say, unpleasantness that may have happened between, between him and VJ, say, mm -hmm. or whatever, to me, it's always about the music. And it's a question of, OK, well, let's demonstrate some things. We can talk about it, or we can take it to the bandstand. That's the classic way. So here's for my next trick. <laughs> I'm going to play all of Kurt Rosenwinkel's hottest tunes, solo piano, solo piano. So now for anyone who wants to hide in the idea that I'm only going to play like, you know, let's talk about the elephant in the room, the black sounding jazz with Tane and Veal, mm -hmm. that sort of thing, so that okay, cool, yeah, yeah, you guys play that style. But, you know, the harder harmonic style of the whiter jazz, yeah, you guys don't like to play changes because hmm. you kind of just want to vibe and, you know, be on this other thing and it's all good. But over here, we're not so much dancey groovy types we are more about the difficulty of the abstractions and the cerebral thing but i know that doesn't appeal or turn you guys on so i see i see these things as opportunities mm -hmm. you know some people will rant and rave about it or yell and scream or try to get you fired or whatever that's not my style my style is to refute on the chessboard the chessboard is <laughs> quite simple it's free of all that. Checkmates is what I'm looking for. So for me, the Kurt Rosenwinkel album was an album designed to checkmate any of that stuff. It's like, no, don't put me in that category. Oh, yeah, we can play Cubism. In fact, we'll play Cubism two different ways with the, the state-of-the-art technique improvising it all the way through no support just my left hand mm -hmm. you know and none need it we're doing just fine here so sure enough when i did that a lot of the critical establishment were shocked and happy because i love the music so for me so much of what i have to say cuts both ways maybe that's just part of my <laughs> technique my left hand and right hand is an equality so that I can do something that's extremely tactical, extremely precise and aggressive ex for extremely um, specific purpose. But at the same time, there's a 
emotional side to it. I do love Kurt Rosenwinkel's music. He has been cool with me mm-hmm. through it all, through the transitions, all that stuff. You know, never had a problem with him. So I emotionally connected with his frustration not so much with regards to any kind of aggression or things towards VJ, but more so that some sort of lack of recognition at some level, some kind of way, like there's something there that I could relate to. And I guess that was kindred to what I felt a little bit was going on with the Anto the Republic album. You know, that by the way, the Anto the Republic album is in red, white, and blue, black, and white by design i made the album look like that because i was making a point about black and white and all that but nobody seemed to catch that Mm -hmm. because i'm subtle like that Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know but that's why going to the kurt thing i was like yeah these subtle bombs Mm -hmm. are noticeable so just let it be said let it be known You know, and to the Republic was a pronouncement to the jazz community in general. As like, you know, and oh, and and to the Republic, this is what I have to say as far as you guys go. You want to talk jazz? Okay, let's talk jazz. Excuse me, I needed to conduct a little business first. Now that I've conducted some business kind of like a gangster Mm -hmm. now we can have a chat you want to swing okay let's swing it it was almost as if you know i have this quality of being mutually alienating to both the black community and the white community (laughs) so i get to you know experience that rarity okay for those of you who like the black jazz Here's and to the Republic, just in case you're questioning my OG-ness. Oh, and just in case you're questioning whether I hide in the blackness, these are all, by the way, bizarre terms, we're human beings. But yeah, in case you're thinking that I need to hide in that tribalism thing to avoid doing real mathematical hard work, in a sort of strange environment. No, that's what rock jazz is all about. I did not come to Lincoln Park naturally. Mm -hmm. I did not come to Rolling Stones naturally or Megadeth, any of that. Iron Maiden, no, or Ozzy Osbourne, no. So I'm happy to come to Kurt Rosenwinkel's music and I will apply the highest levels of known technique to execute this guy's gorgeous music solo just to make the point it's the same spirit that i would play sweet home alabama in people don't get actually some like there's very few people i've seen a comment every once in a while when i was playing sweet home alabama on america's got talent like i was totally clowning white supremacy and that whole thing Mm -hmm. no people didn't really get it but i was like Here I am, uh, you know, you guys are so stupid. It goes right over their head. Yeah. Sounds familiar. (laughs) You're trying to lay, they see it on the surface. They don't see the deeper. Yeah. Yeah, it was a big joke. It's like, oh my God. I mean, I'm up here playing Sweet Home Alabama, like defying anything that those guys were writing about, you know, Half the people don't know the lyrics. Mm-hmm. It's just like, <laughs> yeah, they're chanting along, singing along in the representation of like, you know, American media on America's Got Talent. There's so many elements to this. Yeah. Right. It's it, that, that's the kind of check. This is the type of chess that I like to play. Cause it's like, this is hilarious, you know? And here I am, you guys don't even see it. Do you get the, the joke I'm making here? You know, how can it be that a black man 
from Camden, a murder capital. It's in the news now because they did change their police force a long time ago. Um, how can it be that me, this guy, can come up and play like straight, um, you know, redneck type music and do great? But that was all part of the calculation because I was like, well, shoot, how, is, how can it be that a Kenny G could come and just have all these black people loving his music, <laughs> loving it? Mm -hmm. When I first got into jazz, like really into it, and I started not noticing that phenomenon when everyone, whenever, you know, I'd get around some home folk and they'd say, oh yeah, Kenny G, I would register a little astonishment because I was really up in the Wynton Marcellus thing by this time. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, <laughs> the straight face, no, nothing, huh? You, 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 we were, we're really working hard to try to make some money. And this guy's flying his own jet, you know? So, for me, when I finally felt betrayed enough by both sides, I said, I will become a monster. I'll eat up anyone, basically. And that was the Elu kind of concept of, yeah, whatever. <laughs> so you humans are kind of interesting. So let me get this straight, you humans. If, if this happens, then you guys do this. So then what happens if I do it this way? And sure enough, it worked. Sure enough, it worked. If I had understood it better and was more committed, I could have even gone further. I could have like gotten even, I could have gotten like rail thin if I would have really been really sharp, but I, you know, I just had my limits mentally at that time. But had I been really sharp, I could have like got myself ripped like Tommy Lee Jones if I was really all about it and been playing hard rock on piano with my shirt off, tatted up, like, you know, just the whole thing. I could have gone in that direction. I probably would have gone even further just in the business as far as, you know, where I'm, my standings are. But um, at the same time, I, I guess I wasn't that committed to it, but I was committed enough to glean this much out of it. And the whole time I've always been like, man, this, these games are so, so uh, unimpressive, sort of, and deadly at the same time, you know? So I played the game, and once I got the position that I was looking for, I said, okay, now I can uh, get back to the jazz conversation. Now I can come in, get some festival gigs and stuff like that, because... I have made a name for myself, regardless. And sure enough, everybody's happy. And so, on with the show. All's forgiven. <laughs> it's all good. Well, I think you're pointing to so many things. I mean, right off just that is, is you know, people riding the fence, so to speak, you know, they're not really nesting in like the uh, value they actually hold. They kind of change lanes whenever, you know, it's convenient. Um, but on the whole, even some of the things you were mentioning, uh, you, talking about how, you know, you mentioned this on the, uh, your podcast with Eric Weinstein, uh, you know, sound is free of bias. And once you think in those terms, the toolbox is huge. And I think you very much kind of, like you're saying, you're like, I'm over here looking at these humans playing these games that, you know, you're coming from, again, that top down view. But now looking at, let's just talk more specifically about your piano playing, because you talk about demonstrating abilities in rock and in, in jazz and how, and, 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 you know, on Kurt Rosenwinkel's music. Right. I find it downright almost offensive how even looking at your early monk video, you know, your monk competition video of Cherokee to right. everything you've demonstrated since, um, how it's continually, you're, you're not mentioning the conversation, so to speak about like, you're not just playing at a high level, you're innovating at a high level. And yes, there are many great jazz pianists, but there's not many who can say they're innovating 
And I'm not saying that to like bolster your esteem, but you've, you've proven and shown where you're innovating. So can you talk about and maybe even demonstrate some of those things, like when you talk about your left hand, some of the rhythmic things you've, you've innovated there or counter bop. I think people aren't aware of just how truly deep you're going with jazz and this music and what you're creating that's completely new. Sure. Um, so do I need to play a complete tune or can I just, you know, speak and give you some feedback? It could here be at whatever you feel. Whatever it is. The whole thing. Yeah, it could be, it yeah, could be sure. showing a technique. Yeah. Sure, got you, got you. Well, let me play a little something first and then we can kind of get into the opinion elements and, you know, that particular topic. That's a pretty sharp topic you brought up. And so, okay, we can talk about it. But first, one of the things that I'm most proud about that I haven't super documented a lot of, so to be fair, by the way, to everyone else, I think that I need to document some more of this. It's taken so long for me to get it together that, you know, I can't necessarily blame the, the body politic for not necessarily recognizing it or whatever, but cubism is a step in that direction. Like one of the techniques that I did in cubism became pretty popular, pretty, you know, re remarked upon. So it's given me a sense of like, oh, okay, I, I have a sense of how people are feeling things and how people are growing and, 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 and sort of what, what's needed. So I've removed some of the burden from people as to, from, from, the, from this concept of, oh, you're not hearing my greatness. Da, da, da. I understand that space, but I've withdrawn from that and I'm taking on the burden of demonstrating again for everybody. I need to make it clearer and, and do more. So that's my attitude upon that. But what I'm excited about sharing with the public and you know, this particular technique that I'm in the process of mastering, I call it counter bop. Now, let me play it first before I go any, go any further. <laughs> 